guys and welcome back to the channel so yeah i haven't been uploading as much lately it's really weird uh because as a content creator i feel really bad when my stocks are going up and i'm invested in palantir and rocket lab and both of the stocks are doing fantastic and then i feel useless as a content creator because um yeah it's really really weird but today we had a big red day and i feel like making content so here we go and um this video is about an interview that was done uh, by Sharesies with Peter Beck, and it's actually the second part of an interview. I'm going to put the first one in the description box uh, below so you can watch it. I really recommend you watching it. Uh, and in this interview, Peter Beck gets asked about what happens with the engineers after Neutron, and he starts talking about the plans after Neutron. It's the first time I heard him speak about it. That's, I think, the best part of the interview. I'm not going to spoil it. There is a few good questions here that I want to react to. And again, fun fact, this guy who is doing the interview, who is to me a random guy from New Zealand, called me a random guy. And Dave G, and uh, because he asked Peter Beck, you're going to see it in the first interview. He said, Sir Peter Beck, I've been watching your interviews and you've been giving interviews to random retail investors. So... I don't know if I should be offended by this. I, I found it quite funny that a random guy calls me a random guy, but I, I guess, you know, you, if, if there is a scale where you're like nobody, no one knows you, one step over is, uh, you know, that you become a random guy and then you become that guy and then people know you. So uh, I, I guess I'm starting to make it here because I, I'm becoming the random guy. Anyways, uh, please make sure you subscribe. I want to shout out to the channel members who are always here for the channel. I think we have 19 now plus even patrons. So you guys are really amazing. And if you guys get value out of my video, I would really um, yeah, like if you guys consider joining uh, the channel membership. The, the link is in the description box below. Now, let's begin the video. <laughs> Hi there, welcome to Shared Lunch. Roberts, I'm the co-founder and co-CEO at Sharesys. We've got a really exciting episode for you today because I'm on site in Auckland at Rocket Lab with Sir Peter Beck. But as always, before we get started, video, guys. I don't know what some going. important information. What the heck? I was just. I'm sorry, guys. You have to bear with me. You know I don't do editing on this channel while I'm messing around here what the heck is happening so the reason why i don't do editing while you're waiting for me is simply because when i was doing editing i was doing horrible as a content creator uh, because it just adds too much to my workflow and i noticed that um, when i don't do editing i get the same type of same amount of viewers and you guys are not here for the fancy video and the production quality otherwise i would have zero subscribers, right? Because I don't have a good production quality. Um, so I stopped editing videos. So I'm sorry that you had to bear with this. This is the right video. I really don't understand what happened. Uh, we've got some questions that have come in from shareholders over the last couple of days. So uh, the first one is what made you pick space? So the reason I like space is, is that you can have maximum impact on this planet for for kind of minimum resources and effort. Um, so think about this, uh, you can put a spacecraft in orbit, and we did take an example of a weather spacecraft we put in orbit a few years ago, and that weather spacecraft can provide data and services and knowledge to literally hundreds of millions of people every day, times the duration of the spacecraft's lifetime, which could be 10 years. So this crazy little box of electronics can have just huge amount of impact to so many people. And there's very few industries that you can have that amount of impact or have that amount of reach. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's primarily you know, the, the thing I love about space. Plus, it's cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, next question is, uh, are you contributing to space junk, and uh, is there a plan to clean it up? Yeah, so I think uh, anybody who launches anything to space um, you know, has to put their hand on, on their heart and say, yeah, well, sometimes we leave some stuff behind. Um, we've always taken the approach that we want to leave the minimum amount behind as we can possible. 
So, you know, the way that electron goes to orbit is quite different to most rockets. Uh, you'll notice that there's like a little bit on the top called a kick stage, and we try and deorbit that wherever possible and just leave behind only the customer's spacecraft. Right. Now, um, that's not the normal thing. Like a lot, of, a lot of countries will just leave the whole spent upper stage of the rocket in orbit. Um, so, that, you know, that, that's, that's you know, pretty nasty. And I think there's a, there's a common misperception that space junk is just dead satellites. Well, actually, it's like one third dead rockets and two thirds dead satellites or thereabouts. Right. So we certainly do everything we can to, you know, to, to make sure we, we have the minimum impact as possible. Um, and I would say as far as companies go or businesses go, we're probably the furthest leaning forward on uh, kind of advocating for some kind of regulation. Right. Um, generally, as an entrepreneur, you don't want any regulation. Um, but this is an instance where you know, we, we think that some traffic management is going to be critical. Yeah. And we certainly, uh, certainly advocate for that internationally. I mean, there definitely seems to be an exponential curve in there with regards to how much is going up, isn't it? Um, when you say deorbit, like, so you've got a, you have to some additional propulsion or something Correct. to get out of orbit, right? Correct. Yep. So that, that kick stage has a little rocket engine on it, and we circularise the orbit, deploy the spacecraft, and wherever possible, we'll burn that engine again and put it into a into a uh, declining orbit. What we touched on the, um, a couple of these earlier, but what are the macro factors that impact the space industry and therefore Rocket Lab? Yeah, so I think um, from a, I guess purely from a share price standpoint, you know, there's 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 plenty of you know macro factors, um, you know, that, that that influence that that we have no control over, but kind of generally the the space industry seems pretty insulated from from a lot of these things just because of the duration of the of the of the programs typically. Yeah, do you have any sensitivities to? The so this one was a really really good question actually. Uh, because Peter Beck actually made a very big distinction between the stock and the company. And this is potentially a very big buying opportunity for us if it happens, because, you know, uh, the market is very anxious about maybe we're getting a not so soft landing. And he said that because there's the orders and the programs that are being ordered uh, from Rocket Lab, like uh, SDA, uh, you know, the, the the, the bigger military contracts, they're, you know, five, six, seven years old um, to, to fulfill. And you, you can have full economic cycles under them, but they're still fully funded uh, because it's being ordered by governments or it's being ordered by <coughs> Amazon or, um, you know, very, very big companies. So it, it really makes this very interesting dichotomy that uh, if the stock price go down, goes down because of a perceived reception. It doesn't mean that Rocket Lab is doing bad as a company, and that's a very good buying opportunity for us as investors. So it was just, um, this, this was actually new to me, how, how insulated Rocket Lab as not the stock, but the company is from a potential uh, recession much sensitivity to the interest rate environment and stuff obviously the share absolutely price, yeah right? yeah the, with the share price you know you know we we, we can we can have a, a flawless launch and the share price goes down so what he forgot to mention here is it never happens almost that they launch and the stock price goes down since i'm following the stock goes goes up it's like it's so weird it's like almost like every time they launch the next day the and, and it's successful the next day the stock is uh down 6% or 5% or whatever. And uh, if, if the launch fails, it's down 20%. That, that's the only question. How much more down is it? Don't ask me why. Because of a, of a macro um, environment kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and favorite space movie? Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, um, yeah. And as you walk, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so as you walked into the facility, hopefully, if you've watched that movie enough times, you'll recognise that the entrance portal is actually the right. very similar to the portal of the you know the hell. Be honest, guys. How many of you have seen the the Space Odyssey? I must confess, I have not seen it. So um, just gonna take a pause here, and I'm gonna watch the video. All right, guys, I'm back. I just watched Space Odyssey. No, I'm kidding. But OK, let's continue with the interview. Computer. M what's the most accurate space movie? Well, actually, 2001 Space Odyssey is, oh, is this, actually very accurate. Right. It's one of the few space movies that doesn't have sound in, in space. Um, ah, right. You, you find you see a lot, of, a lot of those movies, and you know the, the, the cruiser will ignite its engine, and you'll hear this roar. And it's like, ah, uh, 
No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's falling over a, quite a fundamental hurdle, I would say. That, yeah. Um, what steps are you take, uh, taking to improve the growth of Rock Lab at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, you, you can see you can see the, the you know the growth rate um, to date. Um, you know, at seventy odd percent. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we're always looking at new opportunities, um, and you know, we're investing heavily into pro, you know projects and products like Neutron. Um, you know, Neutron is is going to be a huge needle mover, and then um, you know, if you look at the combination of the space and the and the, the launch, um, you know, that that in opening up that that three hundred and twenty billion dollar TAM. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're moving moving pretty aggressively towards that. And has Rocket Lab considered an, adding another launch site in New Zealand or Australia? Um, no. Um, g- generally, um, uh, I avoid launch sites. Um, they are giant cost centres. Um, yeah. Cost a lot of money to operate a launch site to staff it um, to to keep it to keep it running. So I want the minimum amount of launch sites possible to achieve our launch manifest because they are you know they're PNL burners. Um, so we don't we don't we don't. More of those. What are the? Comp- this is actually a very interesting thing because when Peter Beck did his interview with us, I think Matt asked him a question about Haste, and he said that they are going to be launching Haste from multiple sites, and he didn't even say from New Zealand. He said because they're already launching from Wallops, right? He said from multiple sites, and I don't know if they're just like borrowing the site or you know they quickly take the rocket there launch and then they don't have an established site i i guess maybe that's the question we can ask him in the next next interview uh but this surprised me a bit that they really just want to keep it to uh these two advantages in operating out of new zealand and what are the challenges yeah great question so the reason why we have operations in new zealand uh, is primarily because of that launch site Yep. So all the launch sites in the United States are pretty much flat out, um, and we made a strategic decision to to not have to line up behind the you know the big players in the industry and wait our turn. Mm-hmm. So you know it wasn't an easy one because we had to you know there had to be a, a, a technology safeguard agreement signed between the two countries, a bilateral treaty had to be created between right. New Zealand and the US, a whole lot of rules and regulations had to be created and amended, a space agency was created. So like it wasn't an easy thing to do, mm-hmm. but but we we realised. It, it now because you know we are the third most frequently launched rocket in the world mm-hmm. and what we're able to do is poke our head outside the hangar and go ah, today's a good day for launch we'll go and launch today um, and moreover it's it, it meets our business model where customers you know move around on us um, yeah. so if you're lined up at the cape and you miss your window you're going to wait months to get your next right. window mm-hmm. whereas if we want to move a couple of days down to Mahia no big deal. We'll just move a couple of days. Great. Are any other companies using the Mahia launch site, or was it just no, no, no. Yeah. Right. I mean, we we operate the only private orbital launch site in the world. I'll ask this one because it's here. So, um, tasty or eat them cheese. Tasty every day. Right. <laughs> nice. Now we've got the important stuff out of the way. To get into this one. Uh, once Neutron R and D is complete and the rocket is operational, do you anticipate that you'll need to reduce your engineering R and D headcount to become cash flow positive? Or will the staff be able to be reassigned to further space systems development while still maintaining a healthy profit? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if, if we were just going to stop at Neutron, maybe. Right. But we're not. Um, you, you've seen, our, you've seen our, our, um, our kind of growth agenda here. Um, you know, Neutron is one important piece of, of a puzzle to, to get to an end-to-end space systems company and, and really move into those products and services and, and delivering infrastructure in orbit. And, I mean, the same question could have been asked of Electron. But the one thing I will say is the one thing that, that has always been a throttle on this business is talent. Right. And we can never pipe enough people, enough engineers into this business to, to you know, to continue on the growth trajectory that we want. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I just can, I, I never see that that being, a, you know, a, a challenge. And um, and and I think you know, Neutron is is a very transformational um, kind of product line uh, in in its own right. Um, and the amount of engineers that that you have to you know to deliver that product isn't as isn't as many as you think, um, and those engineers will be you know quickly uh, kind of you know redeployed in, into into other growth opportunities. Yeah. So there you have it. This was so exciting to me to hear this. Uh, I mean, it's it's actually kind of logical. Um, he obviously like talent is a you know a very hot commodity in in the space business, and they have. A lot of very talented engineers, um, you know, making Neutron. And, and he said, if we were going to stop at Neutron, then maybe th- those people would get laid off. But we're going to go right on to the next thing. 
what is that next thing? It's most probably uh, the space infrastructure. Um, and you, you heard it here. So it's basically the minute Neutron flies, then the engineers go on to the next growth, growth opportunity. Oh, I'm burning to ask Peter back in, in the next interview if that is straight to infrastructure or it's like another surprise that they, um, that they have in the line for us. That's a good question. A bit of a sight tour at the moment. So uh, where are we, uh, Peter, and what have we got here? So this is um, sort of part of the foyer, and uh, this is actually a recovered upper stage of, um, of an Electron rocket. So this is the very first rocket that we brought back down uh, from space, and, uh, and we, we, we cut it up and stuck it in the foyer. And if you ever want to touch something that's, that's been to space and back, then n now's your chance. Very cool. And where did you, where did you find it? So we fished this out of the out of the ocean. So uh, this was on uh, return to sender mission. Yeah. So flight 16, um, and you know it uh, it it um, separated in its normal trajectory, and then followed a ballistic arc. We re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, and then landed in the ocean, and then picked it back up. So one of the coolest receptions, or um, well, certainly the coolest reception I've ever been into. We heard a story about the idea of this when you walk into Rocket Lab. Can you tell us a little bit about the thinking into the space? Yeah. So as you as you enter the portal behind you there, it should look a little bit like 2001: Space Odyssey, and and you, you 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 know you want to be transformed when you come in here into into you know what the space business is actually like. So you know this this area um, is is kind of a reception for sure, but also um, behind the, all those glass panes there is you know that mission control. So um, it gives a great opportunity for staff or visitors to, to, to come here and, uh, and actually experience a launch and, and watch, uh, watch mission control um, as, as it kind of happens. Yeah, and what are, what are the people in there? Mission, there's no launches today, but we've got a bunch of people in there. What are they sort of up to on the day-to-day? -day? Yeah, so on, on a day-to-day on -day basis, um, you know, they're, they're running uh, either whole stage tests or stack tests um, or launching. We also run some, some of our satellite missions out of there. We actually have five mission controls across all of our sites uh, in the world. And um, at any one time, you know, we're, we're controlling spacecraft or um, launching rockets and, and various kind of testing activities out of all of those mission controls. Yeah, great. And we've got a, um, a sort of NASDAQ, uh, looks like the, the Bell site or something from, but can you tell us a little bit why you chose to, the NASDAQ as the place to list the company? Yeah, so I mean, from, from a high growth tech company standpoint, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ exchange, you know, just really suited us. Um, you know, most, it's most accurately represents who we are as a company. So that was the video, you guys. Um, I think this was a fantastic interview. Um, and definitely give, I'm going to put in the description box below the, the first interview that is definitely worth a watch. Uh, let me know if this guys, uh, if this interview gave you any value, please make sure you subscribe, um, join the channel membership if you want to, and I'll see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao.